On today's program, personalizing care in a transactional world. We can humanize healthcare by remembering that we are whole persons caring for whole persons. Recently, the Providence Institute for Human Caring convened a conference for professional caregivers, administrators, people in positions of leadership in healthcare settings, and just plain old folks interested in seeing the best care possible made available more often. Yeah, but here's the rub. What do we call those people in the waiting room or the CT scanner? What do we call ourselves when we're in a healthcare setting? Are we patients, clients, consumers, numbers? How about people or a person? Or maybe they could just use our name. Look, the technological genie is not going back in the bottle, but there is a way medical innovation can hold hands with compassion. Personalizing care, it's what we're talking about today on the Hear Me Now podcast. I'm Sean Collins, so glad you're listening. The conference on personalizing care was multifaceted, touching on the electronic health record, the role of faith communities, equity, aging, naming just a few. We'll play back some of the highlights today on the program and let you know how you can hear the entire conference just a little later on in the program. With me is Dr. Matt Gonzalez, Chief Medical and Operations Officer for the Institute for Human Caring. Hey, how's it going, Sean? Going well, thanks. Let's begin with a couple minutes with our colleague, Dr. Ira Bayak, founder of the Institute for Human Caring. He gave the keynote address. Authentic transformation is possible. At the Institute for Human Caring, like so many of you, we talk about the transformation from patients to whole persons, from individuals with health problems to persons living within their families and their homes and with the goals not just being health, but health and a sense of well-being, even flourishing within their families and communities. That involves a transformation from just treating the problems that people have to caring for them through the continuity of their life, allowing them to grow and develop and experience well-being. Human caring has a hierarchy. I've borrowed this from Abe Maslow and have fleshed it out to make it contemporary for all of human caring. It involves the essentials of keeping people clean and dry and warm. It involves diagnosing and treating their medical conditions for sure, which is where you and I as healthcare professionals mainly come in. Also making sure that what we do aligns with what people want, their values, preferences, and priorities. But also as they get more ill or elderly, attending to the social, emotional, and interpersonal aspects of life, assisting them with the tasks of life completion, while also acknowledging that even at the far edges of life, people have the human potential for well-being, and that together as individuals and families, we can honor and celebrate one another through the course of human life. The three essential elements I want to talk about today are personalizing the electronic healthcare record, routinizing patient-reported information, most commonly talked about as patient-reported outcome measures. And then perhaps the most important of all is reclaiming the primacy of primary care. The joy at work comes from that relationship and being part of people's lives. As they come to the end of their lives, people do have a capacity for well-being and to honor and celebrate one another. We have to understand that. You know, Sigmund Freud was once asked about defining mental health. He was, it was a toss-off comment. Somebody yelled to him at a crowd, Dr. Freud, how do you define mental health? And the answer he gave is to love and to work. Wow, not bad. For an adult to be healthy, they don't need to have be in a good mood or even be optimistic. If they can love and can get to work, they're likely healthy. Well-being is something different. I learned about well-being uh, often from this guy, Bernie Siegel, a psychiatrist who wrote many popular books and gave lectures for decades across the country about uh, joy 
and our birthright to experience joy as human beings. For Bernie Siegel, it was more than health. He talked about the ability not just to love and to work, but to be joyful, to laugh. If a person can laugh even occasionally, in addition to loving and getting to work, they are likely well within themselves. The work that I've done through hospice and palliative care, as well as my own personal life, certainly with my dad and his dying in 1981, taught me that during times of decline, well-being is still possible, not for everyone, but for more people than we might suspect. Well-being through the declining phases of life includes the ability to love, to feel loved, and at least occasionally to feel joy. I want to close by just saying that transformation in healthcare is possible. Well-being is possible, and so is authentic healthcare transformation. These three elements that I've reviewed are part of that authentic transformation, from patients to whole persons, from individuals to people living in families and in homes, from problems to health and well-being, and from treatments to the full breadth of human caring. We can get there. Thank you for the work that you do day in and day out. That's Dr. Ira Bayak, founder of the Providence Institute for Human Caring and Senior Vice President for Strategic Innovation. His keynote, along with all the other sessions of the recent conference, Personalizing Care in a Transactional World, are available for you to hear. Visit the Institute's website for more information. That's instituteforhumancaring.org. Dr. Tammy Quest led the first session of the conference with a powerful presentation, Why Serious Illness is a Serious Health Equity Issue. Dr. Quest is director of the Emory Palliative Care Center in Atlanta and professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Emory School of Medicine. Let's listen to a little of the session, and then I'll be back with Dr. Matt Gonzalez. The scenario of serious illness in general, in in my view, is uh, really the cracking of life's windshield. And so here we've all been um, had that sensation of driving down the road um, and we hear a rock um, hit our windshield and we know instinctively that either the rock is going to star the windshield um, that may begin with a small little crack Um, and then um, it will either propagate um, or not. And the way I think of serious illness is cracking life's windshield. And um, that crack causes acute, subacute, and chronic stress in all of our lives. It uh, challenges um, all all the persons in our lives. It challenges our own personhood, our family systems, our family structure, our finances, our housing, our community, Um, just, basically everything when um, serious illness strikes. So I'd like for us to think for a moment what that experience might be for those whose life and livelihood is already under constant threat. And we're just going to jump in and call out um, some of the most difficult um, things in our in our world right now. Um, we're just going to name it racism and inequity. And We're just going to try to talk about that for a minute and hopefully engage a little bit more together in these concepts in the context of serious illness. So when you are in a situation where this is your view, where I'm driving down the road and I'm always driving behind a dump truck that is potentially loaded with rocks, sometimes stones, sometimes pebbles, Um, and that I'm constantly expecting uh, my windshield uh, to be damaged, that that crack in that star in the windshield, sometimes it's going to be more like a baseball coming through my windshield. Um, I would argue that uh, for many in our society, including myself, who I feel have um, experienced racism across my um, life and my children and my family, Um, really that this is really what your view is at all times, is that you're driving behind this incredible dump truck that you're just waiting to dump more things potentially on you and crack your life's windshield. So um, turning that to healthcare for a moment, 
um, when we think of, uh, of um, how in health um, our, our lives um, are, are cracked and broken, uh, people of color fare far worse than their white counterparts across many of the health status measures. And so I'm going to share two um, slides here from the um, Kaiser Family Foundation where you can look here where um, green means uh, better, um, blue means no difference, and orange means worse. And really uh, what this is, is that the number of health status measures for which a group fared better, the same, or worse compared to their white counterparts. So you can see here that Black Americans uh, had 19 um, health conditions for which they fared worse to their white counterparts, uh, American Indians or Alaskan Natives, 17, Hispanics, 14, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, eight, and Asians three. And here you can see that there are far fewer conditions that African Americans, American Indians, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans, or um, and 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 for Asians the most. But you can see here for uh, where we fared better. So as an African American or Black woman in this in this country, the statistics are not with me um, that I could. I could fare better than my white counterparts in almost anything. And you can see here that of 27 um, conditions, um, I would do for worse in 19, um, uh, equivalent in five and three um, better. And as you, as you look through this, um, the idea of whatever these uh, chronic health conditions are, as those chronic health conditions become more serious, um, you can imagine that these disparities, um, it should not be any surprise that not only would they uh, un be unlikely uh, to be lessened, but could be, um, in fact, exacerbated. So um, further work here in this um, infographic here that I think is really um, quite demonstrative is that health, dis it, it makes the point that health disparities are really driven by social and economic inequalities. And so when we look at things like structural racism that we know um, has uh, perpetuated um, social and economic um, inequalities, as you look here um, to the left, economic instability, neighborhood and uh, uh, physical environment, education, food, community, safety, and social context, and then the healthcare system. And so the ability, ability for us to actually um, try to extract healthcare um, across something that is cross-cutting, that all the things that, uh, that uh, go into our health and well-being um, that then determine our mor mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, health status, and functional limitations. Um, you can see that race and racism um, really is a is a thread that goes across all of these uh, domains. And so the idea that somehow we could get to healthcare um, and believe that we can um, extinguish um, healthcare um, inequity um, and inequality uh, really through simply focusing on health um, is really um, not, I think, going to be um, a realistic construct. So, um, I want to focus more on race here. So living with racism, I like to say it's like driving behind the racism rock truck waiting for rocks to fly out and crack your windshield. And this here is um, a what I would uh, I call the race iceberg here, um, which is that you can see that there are things above that line um, where very clearly if we were in our ship, we would be um, calling these things out um, with uh, great um, uh, rage. So things like lynching, hate crimes, blackface, the N-word, swastikas, neo-Nazism, cross burnings, racist jokes, racial slurs, the KKK. These are all overt um, and socially unacceptable constructs. But what's really far more, um, I think, detrimental is what's below the line, the things that we can see as our ship is going along um, that, that are going to uh, really um, derail um, our efforts toward progress. And so as you can see, there are far more things below this line than there are above this line. Um, and I think that um, we have spent the last couple of years in our society um, trying to 
uh, really uh, start to unpack and uh, come face to face with um, the the uh, what we would consider to be uh, socially acceptable uh, forms um, of, of racism. Um, and so um, I think that as we uh, work in serious illness, the inability to acknowledge all of these factors um, as uh, patients and families and ourselves approach um, serious illness, because we will all experience one at some point, I think is um, naive to believe that we are not, um, that we should not be uh, working um, under the line um, because um, above the line is so uh, repugnant, but working below the line is probably where the power is. That's Dr. Tammy Quest from Emory. With me is Dr. Matt Gonzalez from the Institute for Human Caring. Matt, what struck you with what Dr. Quest talked about at the conference? Oh, I think so much of what, you know, Tammy said resonated very deeply with me. Um, you know, Sean, I, we've had some, some offline conversations, and I think one of the things that that you brought up that that I think resonated with everybody that was in the room, right, um, was the idea of the, the truck driving ahead of you, a dump truck, and sort of not knowing what rock was going to be um, falling at you if you were driving behind it in a car and it's striking the windshield and um, derailing what what most of us would feel is like a, no, a normal experience and equating that to the experience of initially serious illness but I think the deeper thing she was really getting at was racism in our country and this world um, and I think that the intersection of both of those things is um, really um, heartbreaking and powerful and an important opening to the conference for us to begin talking about you know when we were scoping out who and what times um, we intentionally decided that that topic on equity and racism should be a longer discussion than the other topics because it's so important in our time to begin thinking about how we can undo some of the systemic racism that exists in our culture and how we can begin seeing that it has deep health impacts for patients who are seriously ill and and their families. Mike Drummond, the communications director for the Institute, served as the MC for the conference. Here he is uh, posing a question to Dr. Glenn Komatsu from Trinity Care Hospice. Glenn, I wanted to ask you, how has the pandemic moved this narrative about health equity from where you sit? I think it, it has highlighted uh, the inequities even more, uh, made them more obvious. I think, you know, everything is just sort of in greater focus and higher intensity. <clears throat> I just wanted to go back to relationships. I really think that is the key. Uh, we think um, the very theme of this conference about transactional, you know, medicine being transactional is um, not helpful. I think it's about relationship building and relationship centered care is the key to understanding, you know, that person, that family that we're trying to help. And together we can partner and move forward. That's Dr. Glenn Komatsu speaking at the recent conference, Personalizing Care in a Transactional World. You're listening to the Hear Me Now podcast. I'm Sean Collins. Coming up next, part of the presentation by Sarah Vaezi, Chief of Digital and Growth Strategy at Providence. She talked about digital technology and how it can help support efforts to humanize and personalize the care delivery experience. As a consumer, I want my healthcare app to truly know me, to truly know my family, and to help us keep our health on track, not just think about it as um, a, you know, episodic or transactional type of thing. Ease my way, perhaps one of the most important um, of these different areas, but um, just make it easy on me. Don't force me to 
navigate my way on my own, have a trusted health advisor that can ride alongside with me um, and make sense and navigate through this uh, sort of very complicated potential time and do so in a way that takes you know, into account who I am as an individual, my physical, my medical needs, my uh, mental health needs, my spiritual needs, and and just treat me like a whole person, which is, of course, what the Institute for Human Caring really does focus on is whole person care. So um, the Get to Know Me project is what is something that falls into that category of supporting um, and enhancing physical care. Uh, through technology and making it more individualized and personalized, um, and uh, the the um, the clinical care teams at Providence have done a version of this for for quite some time, which is essentially for folks who are in the hospital and um, uh, you know may or may not be able to represent themselves as uh, whole individuals. Um, who are they? You know, having like, what do I like to do? What do, what are the things that are important to me? What are my um, uh, things I don't like? Uh, you know, something as simple as like, what's my nickname? Um, and um, it can be hard in many cases in the sort of thick of things in the hospital room, hard to know who individuals are. And um, in many cases, uh, individual uh, individuals and their families, in particular, their families and their caregivers, were able to supply that information. But at the beginning of COVID, um, when there was uh, a lot of isolation that was required, that same physical presence and the contribution of information from um, from folks' families was not as readily available, and that that really did. Um, uh, kind of contribute to the anonymity of those of those individuals, and um, and so you know this uh, the, what had been done historically, where patients were able or patients' families were able to bring in physical artifacts, now um, was just begging for a digital solution, and so. Um, you know, in order to ensure that folks were feeling seen, that the healthcare team was um, feeling that human connection. Um, and essentially, it came down to focusing on what mattered most to the, the people involved. Um, we launched a, a digital get to know me body of work. And, um, and essentially, that comes down to the ability to digitally contribute rather than physically contribute all of those different data points about an individual um, into a, uh, a digital like uh, digital board <laughs> about them um, and and use that as a mechanism to again deliver folks from anonymity and support them um, and the caregivers who are providing their care and and allow their um, their families, for instance, to um, uh, digitally contribute uh, you know pictures and favorite songs and all sorts of other things. So um, so we piloted this at the beginning, um, or we launched this work at the beginning of COVID and are piloting it. And it has yielded tremendous results just in terms of um, how folks feel about their care and, and, um, and some of the, uh, you know, how uh, caregivers feel about that, the care delivery as well. That's Sarah Vaezi, Chief of Digital and Growth Strategy for Providence. Sean Collins back with Dr. Matt Gonzalez. Matt, you were one of the respondents to Sarah's presentation. Tell me what you think the takeaway is. Uh, I mean, I could talk about the digital stuff forever. Um, <laughs> cut me off if uh, if I go too long. But, uh, you know, I mean, the reality is life is becoming way more digital. And so we need to begin to make our technologies more more human, um, not in a scary sort of way, but then at least that it represents our humanity in the digital space. And I think that Sara has done an incredible job of leading strategy around that to begin thinking about like, how do we represent who a person is? Like, what are their, their hopes? What are their worries? You know, uh, who are the people in their lives? And I think our, our health record systems, they're getting better at that, but they still have a long way to go. Um, so, so let's get granular about that issue. Um, what would the average patient 
how would they experience a difference if the electronic health record was personalized in a better way? It's a really good question, Sean. Um, I challenge anybody that's listening to this who uh, has been to their primary care doctor <laughs> and uh, ask them to reflect on that experience and think about how much you have a sense that that person knew who you were. You know, I went to my own primary care doctor uh, just in June, and I was shocked at uh, how little he kind of remembered or knew about me. And and granted, his job is very hard. Um, but I think that were there ways to describe, you know, who I am and what my experiences are such that he could see that really quickly, that mm -hmm. that I would kind of come alive out of the digital screen and he'd be able to be like, oh, right, you, you know, you're, you're at the Institute for Human Caring, you're interested in computer science, like, you're a palliative care doctor, what must have COVID care been like mm -hmm. when you were working there? You know, those are conversations that, that um, don't happen and could. And I think that that's one of the things that Greg and Sarah and I have been working on, um, this idea of these uh, digital get-to-know-me posters that really tell a very abbreviated story of who you are. So, you know, Sean, yours would be a, a friendly picture of you and the fact that you worked at NPR and all of uh, you were in a, as a Benedictine monk for a while. Like, all of these pieces that add richness to your life it's, it's about, like, who you are as a person rather than, like, all of the medical problems that are wrong with you. So sort of encapsulating headlines from the narrative medicine yeah. uh, thread and making sure that that's at the top of the page, really, of the electronic health record. So when a provider opens up the record and is about ready to walk into a room and see a patient, they're immediately reminded of, the narrative that sort of tells a story about the patient and the part that really stuck out for me is because patients are experts on their own lives that's so true and i think you know i think i think greg said that you know that they are experts in their own lives and we need to be able to learn from them and of course that requires listening we need to be able to listen to them and, and hear that but once we hear that we should be able to capture it so that those headlines as you say are able to be forwarded to other people and so that we can begin to to see who people are at a deeper level. And and it's not just um, it's not just to lubricate the conversation mm -hmm. in the exam room. It's not there to pay lip service to, oh, I remember you. Um, it's there because how do I want to say this? It's there because that story is important. And for a clinician to ignore the narrative medicine thread that has been gathered by previous encounters would, would be a mistake. Yeah. It would be a sort of clinical oversight not to remember what this person's story is. I think it is a clinical oversight. And I think, I think that it's um, important for both, both people in the room, or really everyone, if there's other family members in the room, right? Because as a patient, I, I want my team to be able to know who I am so that if I'm faced with a hard decision, they can help me make those decisions in the context of who I am as an individual, right? If I, if I fall um, and injure my shoulder, um, I'm not the most athletic person in the world, and I may not need a complex repair if I'm mostly sort of living my normal life and not not playing tennis and not engaging in that way. And so knowing who pers people are helps to be able to guide what treatment options that we talk about. But I honestly think um, that it's another one of these kind of like anti-burnout uh, pieces that we were talking about later on or in the ICU about recognizing who people are, that people go into these healing arts, these healing professions, because they want to help people. But part of that means knowing people. And so for me, knowing who my patients are and deeply connecting with them, that's that's so powerful to keep me coming back as a clinician every day. So I, I think our digital spaces can be a lot better at making that easier. Gregory McCool is chief executive officer of Patient Wisdom, part of NRC Health. He joined you, Matt and Sarah, for this session. 
And here he is talking about the who is expert in what issue in a little more context. Everything we do is driven by communication science, um, starting with the basic point that everyone comes to everything with their own frame of reference. Um, I think about this as meetings between experts, right? The clinical team is an expert on clinical medicine, but patients are experts on their lives. And if you're not taking advantage of each other's expertise, you're really missing the boat, right? So um, we know what it takes to have an effective clinical encounter through lots of work in the communication science world. And we built a digital tool to make that a more reliable process. Essentially, what we do is we get information directly from patients or a family member, a loved one, um, ahead of a clinical encounter. We ask them to share what we call stories about themselves, their health, and their care. We then boil that information down into a one screen view that we can actually auto launch into the EHR. So every member of their care team has the exact same picture of who that patient is as a person, what matters to him or her, where they are on different style and preference meters we generate out of what they're telling us, or we can print it out um, for, for folks within the, the workflow. Um, and what we're seeing is that the care teams are going in and they're doing a better job and saving time. So we've done a, a randomized control trial and we saw double digit increases in the percentage of patients, if they were using patient wisdom, who said that their care team member treated them with respect, showed caring concern, showed interest in their ideas and spent the right amount of time with them. And they're not spending any longer, it's just better time. Um, but I'll just give you one comment from a physician leader um, who said, this is the most revolutionary thing we've done since launching the EHR. Um, it's so to Sarah's point, it's kind of the next step, I think. Um, of, of really humanizing the, or bringing humanity back to the encounter. There is perhaps no more humane a place than the kitchen and the table that you find there during the lunchtime break. Participants at the conference listened to a conversation between Dr. Ira Bayok and actress and author Tembi Locke. Her new book is called From Scratch. They met in a kitchen, made some pesto, sat down to eat it, and had a great conversation. That's kind of like the heart of the, the, the book in the way. It's like this, these big moments of love and life and loss. There's a way, I think, that when we lean deeply into love, we would do anything for our beloved, including standing in the rain, not knowing when they're going to wake up and come down, and also at the end of life. I mean, we hear stories often of the father who waited for the son to get off the sure, plane and he walks sure. in the door and takes his last breath. Well, there is a fierceness There's about a, love and at You know this, that you know, you've seen it many times. You know, I just know my one personal experience, but you've, this is your work. Yes, but it's uh, conveyed so powerfully uh, in, in your writing and, and in your story. Food is obviously nurturing. It's essential for uh, healing, for our well-being. But I sense that food, well, and cooking, particularly for you, has become something more. Um, is it? Is it? Uh, uh, is cooking a way for you to practice self-care? Uh, is it kind of a centering exercise? Uh, somewhat like, you know, th throwing pots is for a potter mm -hmm. or sure. meditation, sure. or is it something else? It is both of those things. And it's, it's also, and I, I would add a third. So yes, um, it is definitely self-care. Literally, as a newly widowed grieving person, it was hard to eat. I mean, people know this, right? It is very hard to. And so the act of just getting to the kitchen for me, was multi-layered because that was his space. And so I was actually, I didn't want to go in the kitchen uh -huh. at all. And so when I slowly began to go into that space and I thought, well, what can I make for myself? My, you know, my lovely husband cooked for me for all these years and now I have to learn how to do these things. So it became an act of both 
feeling connected to him. That's the other thing. It's a way of connection. Uh -huh. Food is a connect is a connector for me, and the cooking is a connector. And often, I like to cook alone. I put on some favorite music that you know he used to play, or we'd play together. And it's my way of meditating, centering myself, calming myself down. Right? It's a sacred space for me. Now I know it's not that way for everyone, but as a chef's mm -hmm. wife. That space is a very sacred space. A lot of memory and joy and love happened there. So I don't take it casually. Now, it's not to say that my kitchen sometimes isn't a hot mess and <laughs> right with you know frozen food and whatnot. But for the most part, I do things like I, I you know it, it took me a while before I realized no, I can actually beautify this space. I have pictures of him. It's it, it's almost like another living room. I have pictures of him in the mm. kitchen. I have you know artwork. I have. A, um, something from my grandmother who I loved very much. She had a, an old, um, from the, I guess it was from the 40s or 50s, they would have the match case right next to the stove because you'd like oh, light yeah, the yeah, match yeah, to yeah, light yeah, the stove. Yeah, yeah. And for some reason, all of her possessions, that's the one thing I have, and I remember it from her kitchen, and I have it in my kitchen, so I feel connected to her. And I literally, I have a stove that will light uh -huh. without a match, uh -huh. and yet I like lighting it with a match. Mm -hmm. It's an act of remembrance. So it is definitely self-care. It is definitely a meditation, but it's also an act of remembrance. And it feels like an act of love, too. And love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful, boy, and, and I'm enjoying every bite. You, isn't it lovely? Thank you again for doing this. It's my pleasure. Thank I you know. for writing from scratch. And, oh, thank you. And, and from, uh, for sharing your story with so many people, with thank all you. of us. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ira Bayak in conversation with actress and author Tembi Locke. Her book is titled From Scratch. You're listening to the Hear Me Now podcast. I'm Sean Collins. Just ahead, more highlights from the Personalizing Care in a Transactional World conference. Stay with us. So a couple um, couple weeks ago, we had the pleasure of having uh, Wes Ely on the program, oh, yeah. talking about his book, and he was one of the presenters during the conference on November first, talking about personalizing care in the ICU. Matt, what do you what do you hear when Wes Ely talks? I hear a bright vision for the future. I really am a fan of Osler's Equanimitas. The essay that he gave, the speech he gave to the Yale graduating class in 1890. And I really kind of took that to the extreme, you know, distance myself, create equanimity, don't get too involved or I'll get hurt. And in so doing, that asset that I created ultimately became a liability for me and my patients in that I wasn't diving down into their lives, who they were during their illness. And I was only seeing them as a, a set of organs to fix. I lost my way, and I want us to be able to focus today on talking about finding our way back to rehumanization of critical care so that we do take care of the entire person, the mind, the body, and the spirit. The last paragraph of my author note reads as follows. My why in medicine is about finding the person in the patient using touch first and technology second. The powerful combination of humanity and compassion enmeshed within our modern technological world is the best way to do good for others. It's the vow I keep going forward as a physician, and it's how I will do better more broadly as a husband, father, son, brother, and friend. And I mention that because I was all about in the ICU, this is technology driven, so I was technology first and touch if there was a second, second. But you notice that I said it the other way around now. To me now, what I love to do with my patients in the ICU is kneel at the bedside, hold their hand, look them in the eyes, and ask, instead of saying, what's the matter with you, I switch the preposition to say, what matters to you? And in so doing, I can find out who is this person who came into the ICU with likes, dislikes, color, favorite foods, music, a pet with a name. And I used to put them through a depersonalization chamber, if you will, with sedation and immobilization. 
And now what I'm saying to you is I want to unlearn that. And I want all of us to unlearn that. I want us to, to, to take an approach to caring for the other, which creates this relationship, this covenant, this I thou, as Martin Buber would say, this I thou relationship, so that we can really understand what it is that we're doing and who it is that we're serving. When I was a boy, I read Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. And she was stifled and quieted and silent for many years after some abuse. I worked in the field. My father had left us when I was little and I worked in the fields to earn some extra money for our family. And I watched how the pickers too had a sense of testimonial injustice. They were silenced by their life situation. And I vowed that as I grew up that I would try and use the privileged circumstance and all the booing up that I'd had in my life to help other people find a voice. Later in life, I was able to care for Maya Angelou as her doctor, and it was a great privilege as she was writing on the Pulse of Mourning for the inauguration of President Bill Clinton. And still later in life, as I was writing EDDB, or Every Deep Drawn Breath, I met her son, Guy Johnson, and he told me that Maya always taught him, I write from a Black perspective, but I aim for the human heart. And my message to you today about whole person care in the ICU is that we have to aim for the human heart. We have people in our lives who can teach us this, like authors, Maya Angelou, you in your life have mentors, you have parents who have taught you what to value. And what I hope that we discuss now going forward is how do we value the person in front of us as if they are a priceless person without any change in their value because of disease so that we can lift them up and provide mercy. And I'll leave you with my working definition of mercy, which is that mercy is diving into the chaos of another person's life to provide lifting and healing. It's not enough to just dive into their chaos. We do that every day in the ICU by intubating them and putting them on life support, et cetera. But if we don't also provide lifting and healing, they were not, we are providing false mercy. So let's talk about how we can create an ICU environment that creates true merciful giving on our part to serve people in need and reduce human suffering. Thank you so much. It's my privilege to be here. Here to help us with our discussion is Daniela Lamas. Uh, she's a pulmonary and critical care doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and an assistant professor at a place called Harvard Medical School. Many of you undoubtedly have seen her regular opinion columns in the New York Times. And then joining is Liga Mazarups. She is Associate Vice President of Acute Care Clinical Performance. And this is the newest addition to the portfolio, portfolio of clinical institutes and performance groups at Providence. Daniela, I'd like to start with you. How has the pandemic affected humanizing the ICU from where you sit? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, at first blush, the pandemic has been uh, terrible for humanizing the ICU. Um, the rules that COVID brought with it um, and initially the fear and then sort of the way that the fear lingered, um, resulting in you know, families no longer being at patients' bedsides. Uh, visits to patients by the clinicians being at least at the beginning and then, you know, uh, uh, still to this day, I think, to some degree shorter than possible. You know, the uh, sort of idea of lingering at a patient's bedside with the family next to them, you know, that image of an ICU where the family is present on our daily rounds, uh, the fact that families weren't allowed in um, during the pandemic, not just for patients who were diagnosed or suspected to have COVID-19, but also for anybody, you know, hospitals shut down to visitors. And so that I think is you know, directly contrary to um, a lot of moves that had been made to uh, involve the family in the care of patients and thus make care sort of more, more human um, and uh, you know, more attentive to who this patient is as a person, which is hard for us to know at the bedside, particularly when somebody is sedated and intubated without the family present. And so I would say, I would say at the outset, um, the pandemic turned uh, a part of the hospital where I think families were uh, uh, a really powerful part um, of care that's delivered. Mm -hmm. It turned it into a sort of odd, um, lonely place. 
<clears throat> and then I think it raised attention to that. I mean, then I think I think it forced us to see the extent to which we missed the presence of families. It forced us to see the extent to which um, humanizing care in the ICU was essential uh, because it took away our ability to do the things that perhaps we had taken for granted, perhaps we had not thought of as formally before. And so I think I think now I think I think there's a challenge because we're in this sort of state of of flux a little bit. Yes, families are now allowed back in mostly. Um, we have you know far fewer COVID patients. Um, but sometimes we see these momentary hesitations. Ah, there's so many people in this room, but, but that's not a problem, you know? Ah, should we let them on rounds? Yes, let's. And so I think right now it's at a point of saying, you know, do we recommit to sort of making these moves forward that we had been working on before? Um, or do we kind of let the, the pandemic uh, take us back to a place where families were less present in the unit? What I've seen and, you know, lucky to, to work where I work, I think, is that is that it has really called attention to what is lost when we don't have families, what is lost when we don't have these people who are the source of information about this person we're taking care of, and the extent to which in real sort of medical measurable ways care suffers. And so I think that 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 the hopeful version of it is that the pandemic uh, really shows us the that um, you know, humanizing sort of person-centered care in the ICU, that that's not a plus, but it's a necessity. Um, but I think that that the way that story ends is something that we're still in control of, and, and I'm not sure how it'll end. It'll depend what we how we go with these lessons that we've that we've seen in the past, you know, two years. Kind of related, Liga, I want to turn this to you. Um, what can we learn from whole person care in the ICU setting that translates or applies to caring for patients and populations of, 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 of more broadly? Mm. The final point that I would make is that whole person care, whether it's in the ICU, in the OR, on the units, on the floors, in a primary care doctor's office, it matters as much for the future of our workforce um, as it does for our patients. And we've known for years and years that we would be facing a workforce shortage. We didn't quite expect the impact of the pandemic. The extent and degree of burnout and moral distress among nurses and docs and aides and so on is higher than it's ever been. So I believe that focusing on caring for the whole person might just be the thing that saves our love for this profession. Whoa, we could do a whole conference just on that. Um, Mike, you know, do you mind if I just make a comment about her? Yeah, yeah, we're just going right. to throw it to you. I, I want to close with one more comment, which is this uh, this notion of compassionate care and having the family there. When Daniela said that the family's not present, we don't just lose the ability to find out more about the patient. We lose our own compassion. And it fits in with what Liga said because the family keeps us honest and the family keeps us focused on the patient. When they're not there, I can legitim I can just so easily turn my head away and go to the next bed because nobody's holding me accountability wise. Um, and what one of the things I, I also included in every deep drawn breath is this one paragraph about Steve Treziak's book called Compassion Nomics. And he, I'm just gonna read this short sentence to you. They discovered, and this is very evidence-based, they discovered it takes less than 60 seconds for a physician to make a compassionate connection with a patient and can be accomplished by beginning with a simple statement, quote, what you're going through is difficult and I'm gonna stay with you and not leave you. Compassion is a skill, not a trait, meaning it can be taught. And I want our audience to think, how can we teach each other compassion when it's not necessarily inherent in our day to day? That's Dr. Wes Ely. Also on the panel, we heard uh, Daniela Lamas, who is at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston as an intensivist, and Liga Mazaropes. Associate Vice President of Acute Care Clinical Performance at Providence. Back now with Dr. Matt Gonzalez. Matt, you said um, hearing Dr. Ely gave you some hope. Having worked and seen palliative care consults in the ICU during the height of the COVID surge last year, um, I worry that we've taken a lot of steps back in terms of depersonalization in the intensive care units. And I don't think anybody wanted to do that. I think that it um, 
became overwhelming and awful pretty quickly. And when I listen to him talk, I think about the tremendous power of bridging connections, of being able to liberate people from from their ICU beds and have them on ventilators, you know, walking around and interacting with people and trying to to really get them the, the best care possible. I I'm inspired by the work that he does and the conversations that were coming out of that. I mean you know, one of the the pieces that I was thinking about afterwards was um, when he and Liga were talking and Liga said, to me, oh, you know, I, I had this patient who was in the bed and it had to be perfect. And Wes says, well, you know, it's so interesting because this morning I was on this call about how we don't want hospital beds to be to be perfectly cornered anymore. A hospital corner shouldn't be a thing because that means your patient isn't moving around. They're not, um, you know, messing up the bed and, and interacting with their environment, which is really key for both their physical and mental well-being. Uh, I'm inspired by the work he does, and he's such a great storyteller that helps us to be able to envision that bright future. Did you get good feedback from the conference? Yeah, I yes, very much so. Um, in fact, a number of people that that uh, were first time attendees, they didn't come last year. Most of those signed up and said, "Yes, I I would be interested in coming next year." Uh, and I. I'm thrilled about that. You know, I think the content this year was exceptional and I I was so honored to be able to have so many influential people speaking and participating in it. Uh, it was a great dialogue and discussion and I think the content that we're using is going to be able to begin this deeper national dialogue that we all need to have. Uh, Matt Gonzalez, thank you for the, the time today. Thank you for the leadership. We appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure to be with you today. If you would indulge me, I was curious to ask you a question. <laughs> oh no! Okay. okay. I, I know you're you're usually in the the space of of being the person that is um, asking the insightful questions. Right. Um, but I'm curious what your takeaways were. You you led a panel as well that I felt were was. Um, extremely insightful about merging um, spirituality and community and um, medicine and I, I'd love I'd love any thoughts you had about that panel and and about any lessons that you took away from the conference in general well I think my answer to that is um, the primacy of personalism and you know that's a word that I don't hear used a lot in uh, medical circles, but I hear it used a lot in theological circles. People mm -hmm. are talking about personalism in the sense that any sort of service to our fellow human has to be at the personal level, not at the institutional level. It's really one-on-one -on -one where we make connections with people. And um, that's, I think, no truer in any forum than it is in the medical encounter. Um, that is truly a, a personal encounter. Um, I tried to make the point that providers are companions for people, um, people who are walking alongside the other, accompanying them. Those, this is all language from theology. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of refreshing to see medicine reach out and grab some of those ideas. Now, I'm going to throw um, a... I don't know, 1,500-year-old text at you, but you mentioned that I used to be a Benedictine monk. The very first word of St. Benedict's rule for monks, which he wrote in probably the year uh, 500, 510. Now, there are bearded people from the north uh, overrunning most of Europe, and people are living in walled cities because everything seemed threatening, right? So monasticism grows up in this very threatened society. And the very first word that Benedict uses in his rule is asculta, listen. Asculta ophili, listen, my son, to the words of the master and incline the ear of your heart, which um, that's not a bad way of starting um, 
a kind of guidebook for how to live your life in the midst of chaos. It's like, keep your ears open. Listen to what, what people have to say. Listen to what God's saying. Listen to what the gospel is saying to you. I mean, that's what Benedict was trying to get across. So I find it refreshing to see uh, medical providers reaching for language like that. I love it. And I love that quote and text. Thank you for sharing. Uh, it's um, definitely something that I will remember and hold on to. Listen and incline the ear of your heart is not bad advice for a provider, I think. No, I mean, I think when we think of auscultate, right, it's usually with a stethoscope. Um, but I will say, I think sometimes I've used that stethoscope backwards when someone is hard of hearing and yet you take it off your ears and put it into theirs, right, and speak into the diaphragm so that, that people can hear you a little bit better. I, I think we have a, a long way to go to being able to hear things. Dr. Matt Gonzalez is Chief Medical and Operations Officer for the Institute for Human Caring. Our thanks to all the presenters and panelists from the online conference, Personalizing Care in a Transactional World. Visit our website for videos of all the presentations. They'll be posted shortly. The Hear Me Now podcast is a production of the Providence Institute for Human Caring. Follow us on Twitter at human underscore caring. It's a good way to stay in touch with us about upcoming programs and to give us feedback, which we really appreciate. The podcast is produced by Scott Acord and Melody Fawcett. We have research help from medical librarians Amanda Schwartz, Seema Bakta, Sarah Viscuso, Catherine Gibbs, Carrie Grinstead, and Heather Martin. Our theme music was written by Roger Neal. The executive producer is Michael Drummond. I'm Sean Collins. Thanks for listening. Be well. <laughs>